Laura, thank you so much for being here. As a massive Saw fan and costume design nerd, I'm very excited to talk to you today. Great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to talk to you. Yay. Well, to jump right into it, I would love to hear about your background as a costume designer, how you got into the field and what you love about it. So the way that I got into costume design, it was sort of something where it was like I just accepted that it was the thing that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, ever since I was a kid, I had been doing this without realizing what it was. Like I didn't really, I don't, I don't think I knew what a costume designer was until I was possibly even out of university maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was always as a kid, like doing what I thought were fashion sketches because in my mind I thought, oh, fashion design because mm -hmm. it's about, you know, clothes and creating a look. But now if I think about it, they were actually costume sketches. I had this whole series of characters. Um, and so I would do the costume, but it was a character. And so it had a whole story. Um, and so I was always doing that, but it wasn't until much later that I kind of clued in to the fact that it could be a career. We, I'm in Toronto, I'm from Canada. We don't have a lot of, we do have one costume program um, at Dalhousie University, mm -hmm. but I think in the States there are many more programs. So I, uh, I, you know, I was always a sewer. I took sewing classes in high school. I went to university to pursue, you know, just a, it was a degree in French literature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and then but still doing my my side thing as a hobby oh they have a th great theater department at the university of toronto um i will you know take some classes in oh stage and costume design uh yeah. i'll work on the plays i'll get involved with the theater community and then um and so it wasn't until even after graduating i was still kind of doing it as a hobby moving into styling music videos working on short films and then it was later that I realized, oh, you know, this can actually be a career. Mm -hmm. And so I did go back to school. I did some film school classes in um, just kind of like your basic film school. So we were running around shooting movies on Bolexes, learning how to edit them, taking some design classes as well. And at that time in Toronto, in the early 2000s, we got hit really hard by SARS, like original mm -hmm. stars um and so the film industry now is booming like hollywood north we have tons of productions lots of crews right. at the time we were all so busy but it toronto in particular just died a lot of the big productions mm -hmm. left they weren't happening and it was a really wild time like people who had been working in the industry for a decade two decades you know people were losing their houses mm -hmm. and that was the time that i kind of got into it and so, but on the flip side, it was great for independent film. So I worked a lot in independent film, which as a costumer, you're kind of, you know, it's a crew of you plus maybe one or two other people. So you're right. kind of doing all the jobs. And so I really was able to cut my teeth in indie film. The big budget stuff wasn't happening anyway. So I did a lot of independent, low budget, short films, um, some great independent features, Mm -hmm. And then slowly when things started to come back in Toronto, then I, um, I got into the film union here mm -hmm. and I was able to work on some bigger budget productions as a buyer and assistant costume designer and really learn the ropes because I felt confident in my design chops, mm -hmm. but I didn't know, I didn't know what all the other jobs were. I knew what a department of three looked like, but I wanted to know like, what does a department of 40 people look like? How do you pull off these, right. enormous, you know, huge builds, superheroes. Um, and so it was great to be able to work on bigger productions like Suicide Squad, Shazam, American Gods, uh, and really learn all the sides of it. Yeah. Well, how, what do you feel like is the difference that you sort of learned from those like three person teams to 40 person teams? Like what stood out to you um, in the difference in that department? The difference in the department, I think when you're a really small crew and on a smaller budget thing, it can be mostly about the art. Mm -hmm. because you're all like coming together you everyone has this idea you're working on it together you either budgetary concerns of course but it's not as much of 
a business and there isn't as much management, I would say right. now managing, like being part of larger teams, but also that's the weird thing about costume design is that you have to have like your artist hat, but then you also have to have your head of department hat as well. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of managing of people and, you know, managing of budgets, managing of people. There's kind of an HR component to it that I, th I didn't realize going in, like, what is it like to be the boss of 20 people? <laughs> right. Yeah. You don't expect that as a costume designer. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of that, you know, making sure that everyone is feeling happy, feeling valued, uh, any issues there and just kind of making you know managing the different aspects of your department because in a larger costume department you'll have different people doing different things so mm -hmm. you might have uh like on my last show for what we do in the shadows i have my set team who are working on set um we have people in the office supervisor we have our makes team who would comprise of a cutter sewers i have a breakdown artist a textile artist there are buyers out on the road, there are costume assistants, background coordinators. So everyone is kind of doing their own thing. And it's a matter of coordination of what is everyone doing? Are we working together to right. achieve the same goal? Yeah, because it's a lot of heads to keep track of when everyone's doing like a very like singular thing. It's like, there's 43 tasks, you have 43 people doing one task. <laughs> there's massive projects. And so you had mentioned that you have also done some costume buying. Can you tell me what the difference is from doing like costume buying and assistant costume design versus being a costume designer? With being a costume designer, you are, so I would say you're in charge of the look of the costumes. You mm -hmm. are running the fittings. Um, you're, in con you're in direct conversation with the director, the actor, the producers, um, with the assistant costume designer, that role is kind of, in Canada anyway, it's like the designer's right-hand person. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are certain administrative tasks, but I find for me with my ACD, it's somebody who is basically a second me. Uh, I'll bounce creative ideas off of, um, and someone who just kind of assists with the running of the department. Mm -hmm. I loved being an ACD because I find that as a designer, you don't work with other designers. So you have your way of doing things. Um, but in, working as an ACD gave me the opportunity to see how other people did this job. Right. And learn it's from so that. valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and a buyer, you're out on the road. So as a costume buyer, you would essentially get a list from your designer or from your assistant designer who would say, you know, okay, we're fitting this character. We're fitting these three characters this week. You get their sizes, you have their photo. You might get a little breakdown of the kinds of things that the designer is looking for. And then it's up to you and you might get some direction on where to go to source these items. And then it's up to you to go out, source the items, mm -hmm. um, I like to bookend it a little bit. Like I, if I was buying, I would try to give them exactly what they asked for. And then something a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right. Um, right. Especially if it's an actor that they haven't met before. And I find this happens with me too. Like I'll have an idea of what I want. And then once mm -hmm. you get the person in the fitting room and you're meeting them and they're trying things on, it can really change. So it's great to have options of like, oh, actually the character is a little bit more boho than we thought, or this style is not working for her body. We need to, you know, go with a higher waisted pant. Right. Um, and actors can oftentimes have a lot of ideas about what they want for their character, how, what they see their character. And is that something that you find very fruitful and fittings to kind of have that symbiotic relationship with the actors in creating the character? Definitely a hundred percent. If I can, I like to speak to them beforehand um, because it is, it's like our relationship with them is very personal and it's very close. Mm -hmm. And so even just to get the little details of, you know, what kind of underwear do you like to wear? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any allergies to fabric? Any, you know, body notes that we should know about? But in terms of building the character, I love to hear what they have to say because they've done usually so much work 
in thinking about who this character is. So they'll have an idea that has to do with, you know, oh, I want, you know, I want her to always be in heels or I just some sort of, they'll bring something to the table. Um, and so it's great to be able to have a collaboration. And then when you have a really good fitting, sometimes magic can just happen and you'll, you know, find the right pieces. And that's when the character can really come to life. Yeah, that's so cool. And it has to be so great for an actor too to like be thinking about their character and then finally go to a fitting and put the clothes on and really be like, okay, now I'm immersed in the world. It's kind of the first step of actors truly immersing themselves in the world because you, you know, of course you're having fittings before you're like in with all the production design and in the set and interacting with everyone in their costumes. And so I think it's one of my favorite parts of doing costume design too, is just being able to kind of create the character with them or, you know, help them along in their process too. Um, I was also curious, where do you look for inspiration when designing? Like, what are your kind of, do you have any, you know, go-to sources for inspiration? What does your process look like in those early stages? It depends, in terms of finding inspiration, I would say that it comes from everywhere. Uh, and it really depends on the project for sure. Mm -hmm. um, for something that is contemporary and naturalistic, I, for me, it's helpful to think of a real person, mm. a person that I know or a person. And then that can be a really easy note to give someone too, if you have kind of an idea in your mind and it's hard to communicate it and you say, you know what? It's like, he's Greg from the camera department. Right. And then people will be like, oh, Greg, okay. So hoodie and jeans, like, yeah. And the jeans are a bit too big. Okay, great. Um, so sometimes I find grounding it in like a real person style. And then it really can come from anywhere for builds. Sometimes I will think of um, an element or an animal. We had a character on what we do in the shadows this season and just something about the character and the colors. And I also was listening to a radio interview, Margaret Atwood's husband, um, they've, I think, re-released a book that he wrote about birds. Oh. And so I was listening to it in the car and she was talking about, she read a poem about vultures and I was, and I realized, oh, he's a vulture. Mm. And so, and there was nothing about his character that was necessarily, but I just, I used the inspiration of the color and just the kind of the shape, a little bit of the, the silhouette as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it can, it can come from, it come from, come from fashion. I go back to the Alexander McQueen book quite a bit. Oh, I love him. Absolutely gorgeous shows. And also lots of horror elements in many of them. Oh, yes. They're incredible. I love hearing about that and kind of taking inspiration from pretty much anywhere. I mean, you really can find that anything will spark an idea, um, whether it's an inanimate object, a real life person that you know, you know, people watching and taking nature walks and literally anything in your environment can remind you of a character in the funniest ways, especially, you know, visually, you know, you can really take it in a different direction than, you know, someone who's writing the script isn't maybe necessarily thinking about what they look like. Like many times they are, but sometimes, you know, writers aren't like, they're like, I'll leave the costume to the costume designer. That doesn't really matter that much to me. And they find inspiration elsewhere. And so you're kind of bringing this really interesting, well-rounded picture to a character, which I think is really fascinating. Um, tell me yeah. a little bit about that process um, when it comes to spiral. I'm really curious about sort of how that um, the early stages for you working on Spiral began, you know, from when you got the script, when you started working on it and where your inspiration started to show up. Yeah, so for Spiral, when I got the script, it just read, there were no stylistic notes in the script, really. It just kind of read um, like a police procedural, mm -hmm. uh, you have your traps, you have your killer. Mm -hmm. And I had worked with Darren before mm -hmm. and a movie called The Barons. And so when I went in for my first meeting with him, right off the bat, he said that he wanted to 
make Spiral look like a contemporary film noir, mm. which were like, maybe that was the best sentence I've ever heard. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's an immediate uh, picture in your brain. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because every, like, sure, you know, great, saw a movie. Um, but then to do a film noir element to it, I mean, come on, a dream. Right. Yeah. Oh, so, absolutely. So that was his concept. And then just knowing that he wanted it to look really stylized, uh, it was meant to be contemporary, but in the, in, similar to the way Seven is a contemporary movie, but it has those real film noir um, visual elements to it. Mm -hmm. So that was, I'm sorry, I don't think I, I, I may have gotten off track. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just curious about um, kind of what that, the early stages for you mm. on Spiral looked like. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it was that. So in pre-production, right off the bat, we knew it was going to be a film noir. And then reading the script, for me, it was how do I give that nod to that period without making it look like a period piece? Right. And so it was using a lot of contemporary clothes, which was a choice, but also a necessity because as you know, in horror, we need a lot of multiples. So, so many, so many. <laughs> <laughs> so for most characters, we had to find something that was new so we could buy, you know, 20 of whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so contemporary clothing that had a, a mid-century feel to it mm -hmm. in the pattern that was careful about ties careful about the pattern on the ties giving them a thinner mm -hmm. shape giving them um, a print that felt reminiscent of the 40s and 50s and then the color palette too I wanted it to be kind of what we think of as a mid-century color palette mm -hmm. and then just kind of introducing the DP had a lot of beautiful visual references he had a mood board um and the lighting in the images there were some Wong Kar Wai um stills where it's you know that beautiful it's dark with these hits yeah. of color um and then just kind of unsettling colors mm -hmm. grays and like a yucky chartreuse um and so I wanted to introduce that a little bit in the costumes as well. And the film was initially called The Organ Donor. So I thought, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to pull colors that are um, like biological, I guess. So I thought of colors yeah, like, like body bile. colors, like innards. Yes, liver, yeah. bile. Um, and so using colors like that as well and just keeping the palette really controlled. Mm -hmm. When I think of Saw, I honestly think of that like yucky chartreuse like I think of kind of lots of in like a wonderful way <laughs> like lots of really it's like muted but it's kind of like it's 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 gray it's brown it's green but like an off green like blue you know everything's just slightly you know tonally unsettling and so you know how do you approach costuming a pre-existing franchise and you know making it feel fresh while also kind of tonally feeling grounded in, you know, what the franchise has already laid out because spiral is um, it feels like a soft film, but it also feels very fresh and new and it's kind of a new story. So it's kind of a, a different direction than the other soft films. Yeah. So part of it was, I think it was the blueprint anyway, the fact that it was going to be a noir, um, visual Darren was really careful he wanted to he wanted it to look different so yeah. that was already a departure and I made a choice I've already it's not a secret I've already admitted this uh <laughs> that I have never seen a Saw movie aside from Spiral <laughs> <laughs> and so there was a point at the beginning and I was prepared to you know just watch all of them but then after my first conversation with Darren where he said he wanted it to look really different I thought you know once you see something you can't unsee it totally so I familiarized myself with the characters and the storylines and I obviously looked at some visuals online but I made the choice not to watch any of the movies because I thought if he really wants to start fresh and start mm -hmm. with a new approach if I have 
subliminally all of those other Saw movies in the back of my mind, it's going to come out somehow. So I'm just going right. to, um, I'm not going to introduce that into, into my brain. <laughs> I feel like that's smart though, because, you know, he already says he wants it to be different you know? And so it's kind of like, let's keep it different then. Let's not even look at the source material. Um, and, you know, you get a lot of the um, kind of, you don't get the classic saw colors in the way that you expect. I noticed that it didn't feel as um, dark. It felt like, uh, or maybe dark isn't the right word. I feel like in the um, the Saw franchise, you get a lot of like saturated black, like black is really like lots of contrast. This felt a little more naturalistic, um, but you still got those kind of like uncomfortable colors, kind of murky. It felt murky without feeling like, you know, a 2003 like filter, you know, like a lot of, I associate Saw with like early to late 2000s, uh, like really high contrast kind of campy now, uh, mm -hmm. you know, colorization, but this took a really different direction and you can totally see those film noir influences and not only in the silhouettes, but in those colors. And I noticed a lot of those colors, blue really stuck out to me, like kind of like a gray blue, kind of burgundies, like those kinds of colors. Um, it made me curious if you had intentionally played with color stories in this regarding any of the characters or if that's something that you've done in other projects. It wasn't so much. It was a little bit in this movie. Um, I used a lot of warmer tones on some of the supporting female cast, not Angie. Mm. Uh, a lot of ochre and kind of pumpkin on mm. their two reporters and Zeke's ex-wife. William was a bit more of a green story mm. with his mint shirt. Um, but for this, it was more of the colors, the palette we were working with was so controlled as it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but on some projects, yes, there have been, you know, each character has a color or mm -hmm. a color palette that they, that they stick with either because of um, their storyline or sometimes it's also just a color that's going to be either flattering or when it's called for unflattering on their skin tone. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Did you find that any of the actors changed, like once they were in for their fitting, you had one direction and they were like, actually, this isn't the direction I want to go. And then you end kind of somewhere you weren't expecting we ha I had a lot of fun. There's a character who unfortunately was mostly cut from the movie. Oh, Unfortunate because it was one of the few women in the movie, which is why I'm right. so inspired by your collective. Oh, thank you. <laughs> horror movies because I did an Instagram live last night with Darren mm -hmm. uh, and a friend was telling me that a lot of the comments were about, you know, can we see more female characters um, Absolutely. In, the Saw, in the Saw movies? Um, there was a coroner character who I had a, quite a few options for, and we had so much fun in her fitting and we landed on something that was really stylized. And I thought it was really fun. It was kind mm -hmm. of, um, it was a kind of a dress waistcoat in a Glenn check pattern. She had a little tie, um, with That's a white so shirt cute. underneath. Yeah. Stick pin, um, and I just thought it was a really fun direction for, you know, you think of a corner, you do see her in the movie. And when you see her, she's on, she's in her like crime scene costume, which is right. just a trouser and a jacket that says coroner. <laughs> <laughs> but Not when quite you see, the stylized direction, but. <laughs> no, but when you see her in the office and the scenes that were cut, she's in her kind of, you know, a little bit of a sexy doctor look. Yeah. Um, well, and I feel like with fun. like, especially when it comes to either a period piece or like a period piece inspired contemporary. Um, oftentimes, especially with that mid-century look um, or earlier, like women, just from a costume perspective, generally have, you know, you have more room to play. You know, men were relatively cut and dry in what they were wearing back then, especially when it comes to like a detective or something, you know, they're wearing their 
you know, suspenders, they're wearing, you know, a tie. They're, you can play with patterns and stuff and colors, but, you know, with females, you can play with a lot of different silhouettes. And so I totally agree <laughs> that there should be more women in the Saw franchise and just yeah. in horror in general. It's very, obviously very important to me. Um, so yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, did you find that uh, you played with tropes at all because I find that and I'm on my soapbox about this like all the time about um, utilizing tropes to um, in costume design to kind of further along a character's story and like tell the audience who that character is when you don't necessarily have the whole film to go you know deep in their backstory um, and characters in Spiral that kind of came to mind were like Zeke, you know, has those suspenders, you know, and which is very much a detective trope. He's also the protagonist. Um, and then I also personally love his former partner, Peter's outfit, kind of like retired dad Hawaiian shirt. Um, and I was curious how you felt about utilizing tropes in costume and if that came into play in Spiral. It definitely did. I think, um, especially with the other detectives, because it don't really get a lot of backstory on them. Mm -hmm. So sometimes without it looking like a caricature, you just need it to be a quick read. Mm -hmm. And so the character of Fitch, the guy who's in the finger trap, mm -hmm. he did a little bit of this himself as well, but he he's a dirty cop. And so I just wanted him to look sloppy. So yeah. he is one of the few people, he's in a short sleeve dress shirt, which to me is always a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> Any short sleeve dresser is always like eyebrow raise. <laughs> yeah. So he's a little bit, um, he's kind of, he's that, he's a greasy, dirty cop. So I wanted him to look a little bit sleazy, a little bit unsettling. So that trope, as you say, of, you know, of the dirty cop. Mm -hmm. The short sleeve shirt also, though, was a practical consideration because in his finger trap, we needed, we wanted to see his arms. It was, mm -hmm. There was a lot of discussion of should it be long sleeve, should it be short sleeve, but the right. short sleeve actually helped um, with the trap. Yeah. There's him. And then um, there's another detective, O'Brien, who, and he plays it so well too. And he has the physique, his physicality is really, he's the, he's the tough cop, the one who's right. like hot seeks number, who's always yeah. on Zeke's face. And so for him, I went very, I really pushed his look into that kind of mid-century um, he's got the striped shirt. He is, he's wearing suspenders. What we, what you see as Zeke's, um, what looks like suspenders is actually his shoulder harness, which is such a beautiful piece mm. in that brown leather. Yeah. Uh, but O'Brien has the suspenders. He wears a three piece suit. So in the office, you see him in the vest. And so I wanted him to read more classic, right. um, to give him more of like kind of a, yeah, just a, an inflexible classic vibe. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like kind of like upping the mid-century look in some characters and kind of downplaying in others is kind of what gives it that balance and kind of this old timey feel while also feeling very timeless and feeling very new and contemporary. And, you know, you can tell that it's set in present day, but what they're wearing could be any time, really. Yeah. I think it's really effective. Oh, thanks. He came mostly from Brooks Brothers. I was, right away, I was like, mm. oh, yeah, he, he's coming from Brooks Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, where do they shop? They've been shopping at Brooks Brothers this whole time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> do you find that, um, especially in horror, I find, and maybe action films too, you have to think about uh, not only the design, but also the practicality, as you said, of the costume. Do you find that you have to do any or like cut corners in costumes or maybe a little extra padding here and there or like a piece that you know is worn not only because it works with the outfit but because it like protects you know the stunt double from something is that something that comes into play in your work I think it always does and that's a big difference um that I think it's a bit misunderstood between costume and styling totally because styling is just about, you know, the image, but in costume, an actor has to wear the costume. So there can be even considerations of comfort 
and then it all does come back to the script because it can be something as simple as you know you might read a little line that says um he pulls the notebook out mm -hmm. and starts taking notes and as a costumer I read that and I'm like where does he pull the notebook out from so right. now it has to be you know do his pants have pockets does he have a jacket how big is the notebook um and so small considerations like you know the action what they're doing in it and then also as you said yes is it stunted do we need multiples of it are we hiding a harness are we in toronto we shoot year round and it mm -hmm. gets very cold so there are often a lot of considerations about keeping people warm um because it it's not always supposed to be winter in Toronto. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're, you can shoot in the middle of winter, but it's supposed to be the dead of summer in the film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lots of different workarounds. And I feel like something that people don't, you know, might not know about costume in our department is that they're half the budget is probably going towards multiples, especially in, um, a horror film where you have to there's lots of aging and lots of dying yeah. <laughs> lots of getting blood stains accurate within the multiples different stages of you know blood stained clothing it can kind of get crazy in a you know versus a film that you know any film's going to have multiples but when you're doing something that's action oriented um there's a massive emphasis on the kind of life cycle that that costume goes through just in one scene too. And so I can imagine that that's a big part of something that you've done not only on Spiral, but probably also Suicide Squad, you know, in this genre film where there's a lot of little behind the scenes things like that, um, that people might not really know about. And so I'd love to hear more about kind of your experience with like aging and dying and taking care of multiples and kind of what that process looks like for you. Yeah. So for multiples, uh, it, it always depends on what's going to be happening mm -hmm. and, you know, coming back to the script, if somebody is, if it's a gunshot, oh, you, you probably are okay with five, maybe six. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's a lot of conversation with, all the parties involved, how do they want to shoot it? How many takes do they want? Um, where is the person getting shot? Are they getting squibbed? Um, uh, do they, you know, do they just die? Will they have a stunt double? Mm -hmm. For something like Spiral, I actually had to kind of make a chart because the numbers started getting out of control because for Zeke's character, he mm -hmm. experiences different things in the costume. So there are different, often you have to track things, as you know, in terms of the levels. So there'll be stage right. one all the way to stage, you know, whatever the stage is. So stage one might be rumpled and disheveled. Stage one is clean. Stage two, rumpled and disheveled. He's been wearing the clothes for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Stage three, sweat stains. Then you add blood. Then you add tar. Then you add glass. Um mm -hmm. And so for me, for Spiral, it was breaking down what the stages are and also how many multiples we need in each stage. Mm -hmm. Because for example, once he, and I don't even remember the chronology, but once he's gotten to the glass trap, he's right. already survived a couple more things. So I know I need X number of resets in the glass trap. So that means, but we're shooting that, you know, before we do any of this other stuff. So we have to preset the blood and whatever else is happening to him. So we need, this is stage six, I'm going to need six stage sixes. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, the numbers can really get out of control. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, costume design can sometimes feel like a saw trap because you also have to like shoot things out of order. Yes. But, yeah. you know, you're like, okay, I know the, how these costumes are going to go chronologically and, oh, that'll be easy. But then you have to shoot, you know, the last scene on your first day and it can be very complicated. And, you know, I feel like there's a lot of prep involved in getting ready for a shoot like that. Um, what does your process of getting ready for a shoot day once you've done, you know, the inspiration phase, once you've done all the fittings, what are kind of the essential steps for you in being ready to be on set? Being ready to be on set, it's 
for me, just really reviewing, reviewing the paperwork and rereading the scenes. We go through the lineup um, beforehand. So mm-hmm. the lineup or the costumes that are going to be working that day will already have been prepped and sent to the costume truck where we're working off of. Mm-hmm. The costumes truck supervisor will have taken a look at them, logged them. I will have gone through with the set supervisor and the truck supervisor to say like, okay, so tomorrow we will be, sometimes it happens at the top of the day. Um, we're going to be shooting this scene today. And in the middle of it, he needs to take off his jacket. Right. This is the jacket. This is how it should look. Um, we'll review the fitting photos so that when the costume gets to set, everybody knows this is what it's going to look like. This is what's going to happen. Um, and then, yeah, for me, it's just going through and making sure, reading the call sheet, making sure we have all of our, all of our T's crossed and I's dotted and. Yeah. Lots of management. There really is a lot of just management and timing involved in this, you know, even down to like in the early stages, like timing, you know, what actors can get into a fitting first and how long you know a certain item will take to arrive and like it's always really like a saw trap on your toes (laughs) definitely and the alterations going through okay the alterations been done and then you were asking too about um breakdown and textile art which in a horror movie I think is really obvious you know you see the blood on something you see the cuts you see all these little things but they're usually the costumes, even if you see a costume that you don't think has gone through a certain process, mm-hmm. it has at least been washed um, because otherwise, and it's very subtle, but I think that can really quickly take you out of a movie and will make it look like a commercial. Yeah. If everything looks too new because everyone's clothes, usually people have washed their clothes 10 times, 20 times, 100 times. Um, So it's the little bits of wear and tear. Like you mentioned Pete's um, Hawaiian shirt. Yeah. That one, we we washed it a lot, but we also over-dyed it because it was really Mm. contrasty before. Uh, So we over-dyed it to really kill the white and bring it into more of a gray so that you saw the pattern, but it wasn't um, offensive. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right like uh, yeah and so we even there was another shirt option that we painted as well to kind of to bring down the contrast even further cool. so there are a lot of and then you know we'll maybe we'll like rough up the hem we'll scuff up shoes to make sure everything especially with these traps we see a lot of feet so there's a lot of scuffing and breaking down of shoes so that they don't look brand new mm-hmm there is a lot that goes into there's artistry as well um yeah for this tom waits uncle sam costume uh my textile artist did so much work on the whole costume actually but Mm -hmm. the hat alone this was a it was just a white um like amazon top right yeah that she airbrushed and soaked and kind of carved and chipped away at and did a really artistic um artistic paint job to it yeah that costume by the way does look so fantastic and it does just look so perfectly distressed and it Mm -hmm. actually looks not new which is you know for me one of my biggest pet peeves is when a costume looks brand new yeah and it's just like it hurts because it's so you know it just kind of takes you out of it like something that um Whitney and Adam said when I spoke with her was that a costume needs to make sense and I was like yes that's exactly it like if a character didn't just buy you know a fresh pair of converse then why would those converse have no dirt on it and yeah. you know or you know like you had said with that shirt it's like if there's a real stark white and it doesn't feel like you know he's had it for a while it just doesn't really make sense uh, and you have to think about does this character you know iron their clothes like do they not Like, have, when was the last time they bought new clothes? You know, have they had this forever and they've had to mend it a million times? Like, those are the kinds of details that you have to think of as a costume designer because it really is, it's not just about like, oh, the character would wear this, we're just going to order that. 
it's like, does it make sense in this character's life? Where are these clothes, you know, in this character's life? Which I think it's really cool to hear about all those kind of little uh, details regarding distressing and aging and that kind of stuff. Um, because you can really turn something brand new in the costume department into something that's been, you know, in a dirty basement for 100 years. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, it's all about that suspension of disbelief and really... You know, I think anyone who works behind the scenes, there's a reason, you know, we like to kind of do our work in the shadows and then. Right. <laughs> we are then, what we do in the shadows. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then I take pleasure in it and not really being too noticeable, actually. I think that's the point is it should be subtle enough that, you know, maybe you'll register it, but it shouldn't take anybody out of the experience of the movie. They shouldn't be noticing it so much that it's taken them out of what they're buying into in terms of the story and the world like it just has to feel real yeah absolutely and like the tone and the direction of the film really impacts what you're going to do with the costume design you know do they want it to be flashy and over to the top you know john waters or do they want it to be yeah. you know very real and like naturalistic and kind of you want it to blend in you know <laughs> and as a costume designer you also like i want to put my little mark on it you know I want this to be my work but I also will feel like I did a good job if it's not like super stark if it just mm -hmm. makes sense for the film do you feel like there's anything that you do as a costume designer maybe any colors or styles that you find yourself going back to that you do as sort of like a signature or a personal touch on your films that's a great question and it's something I can see it in other people's work mm-hmm but it's really hard to see in your own work. I find mm -hmm. in other people's work, I can really recognize the little, the hallmarks or the signatures. And I think sometimes yeah. it just has to do with a certain taste. Like there are things that you, you don't even do it intentionally, but there are certain things that you just gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. um, someone commented that I tend to do sharp silhouettes, hmm. which is maybe something... <laughs> Yeah, it's like kind of you don't realize that you're doing it. You don't like, mm -hmm. it's like your own subconscious influences and like other people can see it, but you're like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a tough one. I think I, yeah, I would have to look back and. Sharp edges is interesting. I feel like you can see that um, it's very crisp. I felt that spiral was very crisp, but not in like that, like new stark, you know, all these clothes are new way eh? and just like everything's very like structured, you know, like fine lines, that kind of thing. So yeah. Maybe that's, maybe that's your thing. <laughs> maybe a friend said that a lot of what I do just looks Japanese. And I was like, interesting. Hey, I guess that's an, yeah. I mean, I like geometric, like kind yeah. of. And then I find taste wise, someone, a designer I worked with, Christine Wada, said I think it was Christine said and this is so true that you really know the era when you came of age like that's the period that you know the best mm -hmm. because that's when you were paying the most attention like in your teens early 20s that's when you kind of were finding your look and you cared the most so she had the opinion that like that's always the era that you're gonna just inherently know and understand mm -hmm. and for me that's the 90s and I feel like I'm always kind of I always make the 90s choice. <laughs> <laughs> what would the 90s do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, I'm really curious too about, you know, because I know that like with costume design, like we had said before, a costume might not look like what you were initially imagining uh, in the final product. Um, was there a character in specific that you felt like went through the biggest transformation from, you know, pen to on screen with Spiral? I wouldn't, honestly, no. <laughs> there were not a lot of huge changes. Yeah, um, that's kind of nice. Yeah, the only one, I mean, Zeke initially there was talk Darren had mentioned that Chris had talked about being the black John Wick oh I like that yeah and so all of my mood boards were like stylish slick beautiful yeah. suiting like impeccable tailoring um and then talking to Chris he wanted the opposite of that he wanted to oh, look funny. like a 
yeah, like a schlubby off the rack detective. He wanted it to be very naturalistic and really reflect his income level and his job. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was something that definitely, so I was like, oh, just put these mood boards aside. (laughs) That didn't happen. (laughs) That's kind of nice though, you know, because like we had mentioned before with like actors impact on costumes, you want them to be comfortable in what they're wearing because it helps them give a great performance. And I thought Chris Rock absolutely nailed it. I mean, he really was the star of the show. I mean, everyone was wonderful, but I felt like his performance stuck out to me the most. And he just felt like he owned those clothes. You know, he was really just in it, immersed in it, in his brain. Those were from his closet. And that's why it is so important to have that kind of symbiotic relationship with actors when kind of creating something. So that's really cool to hear that. It, and it's the little things like that was in the suit that he wears most of the film was an off the rack suit mm-hmm. and it feels lived in because we made it lived in I think I don't know if we we might have I think we washed it and then it sat in the office for days with the little trick of you know bags of rice in the pockets uh, mm. string crumpling up the sleeve so that it kind of had that really lived in like bagged out pockets wrinkles mm. at the elbows um so that it really didn't look like we just tried to take it down as much as we could yeah absolutely do you have a favorite costume from spiral specifically that you just like one like loved creating or just like really loved the final product i think i mean these two I don't think it's an accident that these were the two that I held on to. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, the jigsaw costume, because there was just so much, like it was such a fun process to design. That's the one that for me took the longest in terms of the ideation of, yeah, what the different elements were going to be. Mm-hmm. That one, I also felt the most pressure. <laughs> oh, right. Because it's kind of a legacy kind of item and you're like, I'm purposely not watching these films. <laughs> yeah, and for that one though, I did know what the costume was. I knew right. well, you the, have to. <laughs> yeah, I had looked up what um, the cloak was for Saw One, and then because Alex is a friend, we had a lot of conversations, and she actually brought in the cloak from Jigsaw, Jigsaw's cloak from Saw Two. Yes, yeah, so okay. I had that in the office <laughs> during our whole production. Um, but this is the one, yeah, I had to put it out of my mind. Mm-hmm. But it's like, just as look as at the cloak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like, okay, this is the Comic-Con costume. So I have to right. think about <laughs> <laughs> This is the one that people are going to reproduce. Yeah, it has to look good. I think that's a wonderful example, that cloak specifically of like, it's a legacy item, but it's also very much new. It's a little fresh. I feel like it's a little more... You know, again, like that contrast that I felt like I associate with, you know, early Saw, this fits more so with this new color palette. It's a little more rough around the edges. It's a little darker. I feel like the the red looked a little darker to me. Um, Yeah, it's definitely, it's a burgundy and then it's a shot, um, it's actually a polyester, uh, but it's a shot satin. So it is, it has a black, I don't know if you can see, sorry, I have my- Oh, yeah. Um, but so it'll read, it'll catch the light, but because it's shot with black, um, it'll read dark and light at the, yeah. And there's spirals like on the outside, right? In the yes. Back. Yeah. And I'm that just... I believe is a new addition. I'm going to turn on my video so that I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. We did a hand drawn because the spiral graphic was prominent um yeah. and the killer was kind of using that as his um, little thing his yeah. Calling card. yeah we did that and I made it hand drawn on purpose nice I think I did it myself actually because I was like I'm gonna be the one who'll do the worst job of it so <laughs> <laughs> you're like I won't draw this spiral right so it makes sense for the character to have it <laughs> yeah exactly. that's so cool because it's basically like you want it to be that he drew it on Mm-hmm. yes yeah. I love that that's that's what's so fun about this film is that you get the fans will still get the callbacks to like the fun ridiculousness of early saw 
but you're also getting kind of an entirely new film, entirely new feel. Uh, but you know, you have pieces like that that really kind of ground it in the franchise, you know, and you still have a puppet, it's just a different puppet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you have any part in creating the look for that little puppet, the pig? No, that was all, I think Darren kind of um, had an idea and did a sketch mm. and then, yeah. Just kind of had it right at the get-go. Yeah. And the Tom Waits look, I think, is definitely the most fun costume that you have in this. And was there something about that one where you were like, okay, this is the one that I can take a very specific direction? I mean, there's obviously like, a very clear vision of like what the Uncle Sam look looks like. Um, yeah. But it's also kind of a departure from what all the other costumes in the film do look like. Was that intentional to kind of make it stand out a little bit more? Um, Cause you see it in that beginning, right? Yeah, I mean, I knew it was always in the script. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the script and we know that he is we would later find out that he is like a drug addict and yeah. it's a little bit of a spoiler alert, a little bit of a red herring. Um, mm -hmm. But I knew that it was going to open the movie. So I wanted it to kind of set the tone of what to expect stylistically for the movie. And, and because the movie had a more stylized feel, I didn't want it to look like a Halloween costume basically. And that was right. Darren's thought too. He was a bit, he was kind of on the fence with the whole Uncle Sam thing. Mm. Um, he thought it, and it did have the potential to look really costumey if it was just like kind of a, he didn't want the Halloween store Uncle Sam. Right. So I had this kind of dual idea of I'm going to go back to a period version of Uncle, like a kind of a, you know, mid-Victorian um, detailing with the waistcoat. Mm-hmm. And instead of using, you know, the Uncle Sam that we think of today, using like the actual Uncle Sam, the the posters and the original cartoon character. Yeah. And then also the, because he's a drug addict and he sleeps in that disgusting bread factory, adding the element of grime to it. Yeah. Um, but then also making it cool. So yeah. <laughs> it's just cool. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, it's, you know, with the top hat, I was like, okay, Tom Waits is going to be my North Star for this whole look mm -hmm. um and so it was that kind of like slouchy so the elements are period we've got the tailcoat um we have the shawl collared waistcoat we did a fall mm -hmm. front pant and then this is just like a store-bought singlet that started out white but has been you know painted and yeah really, like distressed um we have the bandana that we you know added some little distresses to and then on the hat it's got like the cool paint job, the feathers. And wow. then this, I think we thrifted an American flag tank top that oh, we just cool. got into. And we had to cut it really strategically because there are a couple of these hats because there's the dummy and there's the guy who wears it. So we right. had to make two of the hats. Um, and so we use oh. this for the hat band to give it. Yeah. Was it difficult to make more than one of those hats because it's went through you know it's such a handcrafted item you know like it's a new hat and you have to kind of mold it the exact same way uh madeline Bryan, my textile artist worked on both of them at the same time oh nice so she was able to just kind of like pinpoint at the same time yeah but of course and the character wasn't cast when mm. we had to start buying the costume well when we bought the hats so I was like we're just gonna buy the biggest size and if we have to put hat foam in it and of course you know there's always one that looks better than the other right often it's the it's one that you want one. second <laughs> um, and so this the one that is not the best goes on the stun there you go <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool yeah I know that's always scary when you have to start buying before they're casted or like when they're casted really last minute that's like my worst nightmare but it's also very much like it's a thing that happens and you have to be prepared for it or start buying really strategically and like things like a hat where at least you know you can add that hat foam or you know buy something large that you can then shrink if you really need to uh but yeah that's always a very scary thing when it comes to any character when you're like I don't know what I'm going to be able to get this person in to for a fitting um, but there's always ways around it like that. 
True. Yeah. And that's something, especially being in Canada, that's something that happens a lot. That was, you know, if there was anything good that came out of COVID and there were some good things. Um, but one of them was that we didn't have to deal with as much last minute casting. <laughs> right uh shooting this season of what we do in the shadows like in the full-on pandemic what often happens in television is that you will get an actor the day before maybe the day of mm. um sometimes you don't know who the cast like who it's gonna be and yeah, so yeah. you really don't have a lot of time to work with them yeah what's the difference for you that you've noticed in working in tv versus working um on a film? In a nutshell, I would say that television is just harder. <laughs> mm. That's um, what I've heard. It is, yeah. Because the expectations are the same. Like these days, the quality of what's produced for television, I would say, is equal to the quality of what's produced for film. But you just have much less time. So you might be shooting. Um, you know, you're shooting a feature film. And if you're block shooting, you're shooting three feature films at once every couple of weeks. Right. Yeah. So it's just much more intensive and fast paced. You have like more scenes to shoot less time. Yeah. It's, I mean, there are, obviously there are other considerations as well. You can kind of get away with a little bit more. There isn't the consideration of, you know, is this detail going to be on an enormous screen in a theater probably not television screens are smaller we don't see a lot below the waist or below the knee um so you can you know it's a little bit different and right you can kind of get away with some things as far as you know high def detail it's going to be much smaller it's not going to be blown up most likely, unless someone projects it at a drive-in or something. <laughs> but yeah, that's the thing. You never know. And television, like the actual TV sets nowadays are so high quality. I know they're getting bigger. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Soon it's just all going to be a theater. We're all just going to have home theaters. Yeah. And then we'll have no way around TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was really curious too, just kind of your thoughts on the impact of costume design, you know, in film and TV. Um, because I think that it's, you know, this is why I always harp on about costume design, even when I'm not costume designing. It's because it is genuinely, you know, along with many other creative departments, you know, like art department, that kind of thing. Costume's very integral to the screen because it's, you know, a lot of what you're seeing on the screen is taken up by costumes, you know, a large percentage is, and it really can shift the tone of the story that you're trying to tell. Um, and I would just love to hear your thoughts on why you feel like costume design is impactful. Um, and also how maybe in the horror genre, uh, what makes it important to horror specifically as well? Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, you, you really nailed it. Costume design is very impactful, partly because of you know, anytime you're watching a movie, you're probably looking at a costume. <laughs> right. Uh, and it does take up, you know, if you think of, and this is why, I don't know if things are, they're slowly changing. I think that there are a lot of reasons why in general, not to get political, but honestly, costume design is an art that I think is less respected and is also the level of pay um, is much lower than it should be. Mm -hmm. Um just the department in general i think it's partly because we are a department of mostly women yeah 100 percent. yeah which is what i love about it like i'm a girl's girl and so mm -hmm. i love that in this world of film where there are a lot of dudes in my department it's like you know all women and a couple of gay men i yeah, love that exactly. it's kind of like a little safe space you i don't know it's easier to there's, there's definitely a common understanding between women in film that we are the minority and we don't want to be. Definitely. But it's easy to dismiss it because it's one of the things I think um, it's a little bit misunderstood because everyone puts on clothes most, I mean, almost every day. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes people don't understand the difference between a costume design and just, you know, 
the quote unquote glam squad. Oh, you know, we're just like, just right. everyone can put on clothes. Um, and so I think, especially on the heels of the pandemic, now people are consuming, you know, they're at home, they're watching a lot and people are getting really interested in costume, right. which is great uh, because it really does, you know, it supports the story. It is what is helping to create the characters we're really like, it's a big part of creating this world. Um, and we also have a lot of contact with the actors. So if you think about, you know, right. like I love production design, sets are amazing. You see the costumes as much as you see the sets. And we are often, you know, we're in constant communication with the actors. We're helping them create their character. And we're often one of the last people that the actor is talking to before the cameras are rolling. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of communication um, and closeness there. Yeah, there is a sense of um, kind of being the set mom in a way, which is maybe, you know, one part of me is like, feels patronizing that they treat us like the set mom just because we're a group of women. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's true because you're just in kind of you have to talk to every department you're in constant communication with the actors everyone is involved you know and you're sort of the point person in between it all that everyone has to coordinate with um and you're also oftentimes the actor's ally you know amidst it all amidst the you know businessy side of film and when they're being told you know that they're being directed in a way that they're not comfortable with. You know, many times I've had them come to me when I'm doing costume design. Um, and, you know, if they, if, you know, a director or a producer wants them to wear something they're not comfortable with, you know, we have to stand up for, no, they're not comfortable in that. Here's some alternatives. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more than, you know, like you had said, it's so much more than the glam squad. It's really not that at all. You know, you really have to dive into the story to kind of pull out from the story what this character would be doing and wearing. Um, and like you'd mentioned before, just the job itself is so much more than that. There's so much HR involved. Um, and I think we're still at the very early stages of costume design, getting recognition just in the industry in general. Um, you know, even in horror specifically, there's many, many films in like the 70s and the 80s even that just didn't even have a costume designer or they hired, you know, a costume supervisor and no one else on the team because they could pay a lower rate. And it's just kind of wild that the conversation's still coming around and there is still this stigma, one that even, you know, even like glam squads would be something that is, you know, or should be looked down upon or not as, you know, just not as hardworking as other departments, because I just think that's so far from the truth. And I, I just, I completely agree with you. I do think that costume designers deserve better pay um, and more recognition for the work that they do. It's kind of like, we're okay being in the background, but, you know, we would like the verbal, you know, confirmation from others that our work is valuable in the industry yeah if you think about how much screen time and you know it's a visual medium and on a screen how many pieces of costume are you seeing if it's right. you know, your cast if there's a big background scene and all the thought that goes into you know the colors the textures all of that you know it's like a painter with her palette and you're you're contributing to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do you feel like differs from, you know, how does horror differ from other genres when it comes to costuming, when it comes to the impact it has on screen? I have to admit that I'm not the biggest, <laughs> I'm not a horror buff. Um, so it's not something, it's not a genre that I'm overly familiar with, mm -hmm. but in terms of the experiences that I've had with the horror movies that I've either seen or worked on, one of the things that stands out to me is that you don't really have a lot, the timelines are very compressed. Mm -hmm. Some action movies can be similar too. Um, 
And so you don't really have a lot of script days necessarily to tell a story. It's not like, you know, the, you know, terms of endearment, um, yeah. you know, generations of people. No, you have like a couple, probably two costumes, two or three costumes to really telegraph who this character is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you kind of have to nail it in, in, in those handful of looks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I like about doing horror costuming in my experience is, um, especially in like short films that I've done, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of time to really explain this character and you sort of have to do your best through the costume work because, you know, and of course production design, but you know, what they're wearing can really, you know, lay out a story and it's really important in any genre, but especially horror, like you had mentioned. Um, yeah, for sure. And I, I mean, I wasn't the case in Spiral and I can't really think of any examples costume wise for this, but I think that one thing that horror does really well is it uses, you can use the horror genre to really make a lot of social commentary. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for joining me today. This has been really fantastic, especially as a costume design nerd and a massive Saw fan. I super enjoyed Spiral and this has just been an absolute pleasure. Amazing. Thank you so much. It was great chatting with you. Yes, thank you so much. And I hope everyone enjoyed listening to this little chat. Um, Laura, where can we find you on social media? And do you have any upcoming projects that you want to give a little shout out to? On social media, on Instagram, I'm at Laura Montgomery Design. And on Twitter, I am at Laura M Online. In terms of upcoming projects, Spiral just came out on video on demand. So wherever you get that, you can watch it. I encourage you to do so. Um, and I just finished season three of What We Do in the Shadows. And so that will be airing on FX, I hope very soon. Yay, super excited to check those out. Thank you so much, Laura. And I hope you have an amazing day. Thanks, you too. Bye.